Welcome back to the podcast that exists to enrich and inspire young Latinos. Bienvenidos al podcast que existe para enriquecer e inspirar a jóvenes latinos. Welcome, welcome again to, to this, your podcast, The Year of the Gospel. Today, I'm uh, honored to have not only one of uh, the people that I admire the most, but he also happens to be my boss, Josh Hill. <laughs> not a boss, not a boss. Team Josh, thank you so much you. for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Vicente. And I, um, for any, ever, all the listeners out there, Vicente is one of the greatest humans on earth and as you tune in, you know he inspires across the uh, the internet waves, but also those of us who get to work with him. Honored to be uh, here with you. Thank you, Josh. For those that don't know you, Josh, uh, tell me a little bit. I know that you're not from Chicago, but now you are very well connected to Chicago. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit of your story. How did, how did you happen to come to Chicago? So I, um, well, you're nice to ask, and I, I, uh, I know I feel like I don't know if Chicago has accepted me as an official Chicagoan, but I, I consider myself one. I grew up in um, the Boston area, and um, I was there through high school. And then I, I made a, a jump to Milwaukee to go to college. I went to Marquette University with the Jesuits, and uh, through that kind of relationship and uh, getting connected with their you know, charism and the work of the Jesuits. I uh, applied to and was accepted to the Jesuit Volunteer International Program. So then I ended up in the Marshall Islands. And I, you know, talk about decisions you make in your life. Wow. I'm excited to go go live someplace and and um, to be a volunteer teacher and to live in commu- a faith community. Um, sounded very appealing. But I decided to go to a place, I, I, I probably should know more about where I was going. So I decided to go to the Marshall Islands, which is out in the Pacific. It's um, just about on the equator, and it's just across the date line. So it's out near Guam, and um, that'll be the, probably the closest. And so you kind of fly to from here. You fly from here to L.A., L.A. to Hawaii, then from Hawaii kind of southwest over the date line and somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. And I fell in love with it. I lived in a faith community and um, at a uh, Catholic parish, and I taught. In, there was an elementary school and high school. I taught in the high school. And um, I got, you know, run out of college. And, you know, I, I still think those poor kids have got an education for me. Who knows what happened with that? But the, um, you know, I was able to be a teacher and I taught high school accounting and uh, literature and writing. And, uh, but I also got to do a lot of different things. I started the radio show when I was there. You know, we used little tape recorders. That nobody will know what those are. And interviewed and covered stories. We started a theater group. We, I coached basketball team. I, I did not play basketball. I played hockey, but just got to do so many things. But more than anything, um, and the Marshallies are beautiful people. I got to um, live and work and walk with the Marshallese, and uh, it just I fell in love with it. And um, so it was a great experience, and certainly had a dramatic impact on my life and probably the trajectory where I ended up. And so I, I did my two years there. I stayed a little longer. And I came back and um, even though I said I wouldn't, I kind of got back into the, you know, maybe the rat race of I got to get a job. I got to, you know, uh, climb a ladder and earn more and do more. And so I went to work for a, a consulting firm, um, a management consulting firm, which I loved, frankly. They were great people and I learned a ton. We worked in um, strategy with uh, large corporations, traveled a lot, met with people, worked on building strategies and companies. And I was just like, you know, I was a peon in the company. I was uh, doing a lot of, you know, taking notes and I learned a lot listening and watching, but I was there for about, you know, five years. I was looking at business school and a Jesuit friend of mine, he would call me from time to time and he would say, what are you doing for the kingdom? What are you doing for the kingdom? And, uh, <laughs> you know, yet, so I, maybe a lot of guilt and I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to transform that into you know, um, a life, you know, how do you, you know, I had been overseas and volunteer, but I didn't know how to kind of transform that. I didn't see the pathway. And thankfully he helped me find it. And it was, um, this Jesuit, uh, father Vin who introduced me to 
Cruiser Ray Jesuit High School here in Chicago shortly after it opened. And they were looking for someone to be the director of development and public relations at Cruiser Ray Jesuit High School. And this is probably three years after it started. So, um, and what was interesting is I said, well, I've never raised money and I don't know anything. I've never done PR or anything about either one of those things. He said, don't worry about that. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. I was young. I was 27, maybe. So I, I haven't been in Chicago for work. Um, and I went and visited Chris Ray and kind of did an interview with the president there, Father Foley. And we really hit it off. And um, I, I thought, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this. I, I really want to work here. And then I was I went from learning about something to like really selling because I wanted to work there. I didn't know anything about development. I didn't know anything about PR. And so, uh, you know, thankfully, Father Foley took a chance on me. And I met with people on the board and the community, and they were all okay with it. And so a few weeks later, they made an offer. And I, I remember, um, you know, I, I remember seeing the salary, and I thought, oh, my goodness, how am I going to? And um, I met with Father Foley, and I thought, well, I'll negotiate. I think I negotiated backwards. So whatever it was, <laughs> I really wanted to be there. And literally, I accepted the job. And two weeks later, I, I didn't have anything, but I drove across country in my little beater of a car. And I had no place to stay. They let me live in the school for a um, couple months. And um, I jumped in and started working and then lived in, um, I rented an apartment there from a great family in the Pilsen neighborhood. And it just, it, I think that was, you know, five of the best years of my life, living and working at Chris Array Jesuit High School uh, to be part of a, a team that was really building a whole new model of mission um, uh, again, living in a, a, just a vibrant, wonderful community, living and working in Pilsen, little village, this immigrant, primarily Mexican community, uh, who were wonderful. I mean, just, I learned so much from the community. I, um, my soul was filled by being with them, their, their spirit of faith, their spirit of, of just, you know, focusing their children and, 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 um, a brighter future. Um, the spirit of working together and community. I just, I fell in love with it. And they, you know, the community was kind and allowed me to, to, to join and be part. And so I was there for five years and really I, I say five of the best years of my life. It was wonderful, wonderful. And, um, and just by having circumstance, I, someone came to me and uh, Big Shoals Fund was looking for someone. And again, it was a similar mission and working in Catholic education and under-resourced communities. And again, I don't know, thank goodness someone took a chance on me. I didn't have, I don't think I had the skills or anything else to kind of make sure it was fun, but I was invited. And um, again, once I learned more about it, I went into sales mode, like how do I get this job? I want to work there. What a great mission, um, you know, in Chicago and to work. So I, I ended up getting the job and that was, I think, 16 years ago. It's back in 2005, a long time ago. I am like a dinosaur here, Vicente. <laughs> and um, and these have been 16 of the great years. I've worked with great leaders, mission-based, focused people. Everybody's about the mission. Um, I feel like in our organization, there's no politics. It's just about it's about the kids, it's about the community, it's about the it's about the mission. And so I feel lucky every day I get to work with people like you and that um, carry this mission so deep in your heart. It's not. Um, a job it's a way of life it's a it's a it's a passion and a calling and i it's a i got lucky i got really really lucky to be in this in this in this way you know i really a way of life a really way of of living out maybe faith and building community so i love it yes today you are probably one of the most influential uh people in chicago just because the impact that you have in thousands and thousands of, of families uh, you know, you, you're really a servant leader. As you look back to your service overseas, what are, what are some of the things that, that you think impacted you and who, back then and, who, and helped you become who you are today? That is a great question. I think, um, I, you know, uh, so going back a little further, one of their experiences that really impacted my life was when I was young, um, our parish, my, my mother, really. Some of my mother got linked in with, uh, um, she had some nursing background training. And there was a group of women in our community that would go down to Haiti every year. Throughout the year, they collected supplies, medicine, 
um, other things for uh, medical facilities down in Haiti. And so then she started going down and she was working there. And my mother came back at one point and she said, well, I have five kids, which she equates to labor, uh, uh, free labor. And so she said, you guys are going to go. And, and so we started going down with my mom on, you know, trips to Haiti. And then it kind of grew into others from our parish heard about it. And they're like, Hey, you know, my kids go as well. And then our high school. And so she would lead trips down there. We would go and uh, we would live in a, in Port-au-Prince, which is the capital there. We would live in a home. And so we'd raise money throughout the year and you'd um, pay $15 a night to live in this home. And um, it was a home for boys coming off the street uh, to have a place to stay. And, um, and so we literally, we, we washed our clothes in buckets with them. We ate the same meals. It was, but the funds we raised and paid to stay there helped fund the mission. And then we would go out to other missions to um, not all, but primarily Catholic um, uh, services programs. One was actually a group of, of, of religious and lay from Mexico. Uh, which is one of my favorite places to go, frankly. They were up in the, just outside the city in the hills, and they created a, effectively a, an orphanage for kids. And they built it all, and we would go up there and dig ditches for latrines and help build um, housing and school buildings and all sorts of things. And um, they were a wonderful community. But I look back at those trips. I look at my time overseas in the Marshall Islands, and I was inspired by leaders in those community who brought people together to accomplish something. And you know, down in Haiti, I met some unbelievably um, faith-filled, strong leaders that invited people, whether it was from overseas or from local communities, to come together in a common mission and to be on a team working towards something together. And um, in the Marshall Islands, same thing. At Cris Array, the same thing. And so it was... It was you know, leaders in all sorts of ways, not always like the head of the organization, but um, people filled with a sense of calling. And whether it's a Marinol sisters or it was a, a member of the parish down in, in um, the Marshall Islands, or um, I remember a woman who led a hunger drive in, in Pilsen when I was there. And I'd never been so, you know, I'd heard about it, but in, in proximity, like I knew this woman, I knew her daughter, I knew her family, I knew her, their, their um, the grandmother in the family. I mean, I, and to see someone so filled with a calling to do something and watching others come in. I, so um, along that trajectory, I, I saw a lot of people, you know, sometimes we hear about a leader of a company or a country or, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's the people in the community who really inspire and take on in a way that is, so inspirational and to be able to to watch and to learn from and to be inspired by that uh calling i think is one of the strongest leadership examples i've ever seen and remembering that that's where real leadership happens um not in some faraway place but right there in the community and if you're able to be in there and to allow yourself to 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 and, and you're invited in frankly by being um supportive and working alongside I think that's where I learned the most. Yes. Uh, what I'm hearing is service is important. Yes. Serving is going to going to have an impact in your life and it's going to really going to influence who you become. But it's not, you know, just when you talk about going to Haiti, it might not sound attractive to a young person. What would you tell a young person that is struggling with the idea of, of service, is struggling with the idea of, you know, going to a local community and uh, get involved in the food pantry and a local community organization. Uh, a lot of times, especially young people are, uh, you know, thinking, you know, how am I going to become successful? But we are not thinking about service. And uh, when I look at you and how how you inspire others, right? I I can make that connection. If you would have never done this service service. Uh, uh, experiences as a young person, you'll be a different kind of leader. Oh my goodness. Um, right? Yes. So what would you say to young people that are thinking, should I get involved? Should I give back? Should I do a service trip? Should I, you know, go and volunteer at the border? Uh, what would you tell them? That's a great um, question. I think 
you know, uh, you know, with my mom and the trips, you know, I was a good, I, I was a good listener to my, not disobeying my mother. So first and foremost, I, I listened to someone telling me you're going down here and that benefited me greatly because she knew. And so one listening to those who love and care for you and are encouraging you. The other thing I would say is, um, being open to that, you know, the, that calling I, um, coming out of college, you know, we, um, in a, we live in a, a society where we measure things in lots of different ways. And I'm not putting any measurements down, but there's different measurements. I remember being concerned about graduating from college and going off and doing two years of service. And I kept thinking about, well, I said, what about my career and how can I, I'm going to fall behind and, you know, others are going to be out, you know, starting the career and climbing the ladder and they're going to be earning more, they're going to be more successful. And, I, you know, this, how can I do this? And, and I remember, I think it was my dad actually, who at some point said, he came, we talking about this decision, he brought a ruler. He said, you know, there's lots of ways that people measure things in life and some, and some people measure it by where they climb in an organization or rise to. Others look at how much they earn and how much they have and um, others measure it by impact in the world or, um, you know, different things. And he said, you got to figure out, you know, what it is. Otherwise, you're going to be comparing to something that doesn't fill your soul. You're not going to be happy. If you're not called to something, then you're never going to. And once I kind of let go of that feeling, and it still, it still peaks back in even to this day. You know, it's hard to, you know, let go sometimes. But once I kind of reacclimated, it was don't measure yourself against these things that really don't matter to you, but you've decided somehow. And when I just let go and I went down, it was, again, I two of the best years of my life of being overseas. I learned. So I learned more there than I ever would have learned in any other experience. And I put it up that, and the experience is totally different. I was able to grow and develop. I, I think also as a as growing up in America and going outside of our country and looking backward at it, from Haiti and from uh, the the Marshall Islands, I looked a lot different than our country and our culture, and different structures in a way that I never could have done that. And I grew in a way that I never could have. I was given more responsibility, and so if I went back in 20 years, I would have done another two years after that, because I think that the ability to grow in that environment and develop a, a, a sense of, of the world that, you know, growing up in the, my little town of Danvers, if I had stayed there and I never would have had this broader sense of the world that has made me a better person, more empathetic, more open. I would say, you know, not a lot of people would say this, uh, that I'm smart, but smarter in terms of understanding that, you know, um, just because you have this point of view and experience, that is not the answer. And even this idea of I was going to Haiti or I was going to the Marsh Lions that I had answers that I came from America. That's a very American view. I learned more from them than anything. And um, and we all have a lot to learn from those experiences. So a long way of saying that um, letting go and not being afraid to 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 experience something that may seem scary or not the right path that those are the ones that I think lift you up the most. And um, even when I was leaving the Marshall Islands, I remember thinking about coming back and uh, this is going to make me sound really old. While I was in the Marshall Islands, the internet kind of happened. I remember the cover of a Newsweek magazine when I was down there, the invention of the internet and reading about it. And everybody was talking about these emails and websites. And I've been in the Marshall Islands where, you know, I was living in a, um, tin roof, cinder block, no running water. Um, it was a lot different than what I was reading about Newsweek that were being sent down to me. And I thought, how am I ever going to, I had this great fear again. And those little things along the way, if I could go back and say, don't worry about this future, live in the moment, ex continue experience. And I look back and I probably missed out on 20% of my time in Marshall Islands because I was worried already about what was next. And I think sometimes with age, I've learned, live in the moment, keep experiencing it because you're going to miss out on things because you're so worried about what's coming next. And um, it's taken some time, but a long way of saying there's so many great experiences. Don't pass them up, jump on them, live in the moment and uh, the future will build. Yeah. Thank you, Josh.
a lot a lot of young people like to have access to somebody like you like for for mentorship uh you're really a great a great leader uh josh so this question is important if you can give yourself like your 20 year old self an advice also taking in consideration that a lot of the young people that are going to listen to us are coming out of a pandemic maybe we yes. are in the middle of the pandemic what would you tell them i you know i go back to the point it's made about um don't be so worried about the future don't be so consumed with what are we going to do next week you know what are we going to do next year and how am i going to do this and how am i going to you know that live in the moment and find the opportunities that are around you and um first of all enjoy them i think that 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 enjoy them don't pass up those moments and be so concerned that you become immobilized by the concern. I look back at my 20 year old self, at times I became almost immobilized because I was so concerned about what was next. And that doesn't mean don't plan and don't, don't think about and get ahead, but um, you know, whether it's sending out a resume or it's, it's, it's working on something or studying hard in college, all that, but not to miss out on those moments because your anxiety and everything else, whether you do that through uh, meditation or our faith group, or, um, by talking to someone, find a way to be present in that moment. And so often in my life, when I look back in all the anxiety, someone once told me, don't let someone or something live rent free in your head. And sometimes we let things live rent free in our head, these cares, this anxiety, this apprehension, and instead live in the moment and build and be part of those around you and those relationships that are going to ultimately help and I, I don't know if I would have been able to hear that when I was in my 20s, because uh, I, I probably um, had all the answers as far as I was concerned. <laughs> but when I did listen, you know, which is the hardest thing, I have another lesson, uh, to listen and be um, in the moment. Yeah. Josh, you're a big shoulders man. You carry on a lot in your shoulders. I mean, honestly, maybe the, even the future of some institutions, right? Uh, Even the what? The future of institutions that serve local communities. I mean, you carry a lot of responsibility on your shoulders uh, in, in terms of the inner city Catholic school system. I mean, I mean God knows that, you know, you, uh, you carry that responsibility of a sense of responsibility of what the future of, of, of those institutions. You have a beautiful family, but you also have a huge responsibility. What what is your inspiration? Where do you find inspiration? Where do you find your drive to keep moving on? Oh my goodness, I, it's actually probably an easier answer. I I, I want something more profound. But I going back to we talked about in Haiti and Marshall Islands and um, Priest Array and now Big Shoals. Being able to be part, I think I, I get up every day because I don't ever want to not be able to be part of this mission. You, you know, I. I I feel blessed and honored and lucky to work in this mission. The people I work with going out and visiting different communities that in some places uh, I almost feel like family because we such strong relationships and I don't ever want to lose the ability to be part of that. And you got to contribute. I got to be contributing. Otherwise, you know, someone else should be doing, I shouldn't be here. And so I think part of it is just my desire to never be far from what really is the heart of this mission, the very people and communities. I'd love, um, you know, if I, someone asked me about Chicago and visiting or coming here and they'd say, oh, you know, gosh, going down the Magnuson Mile or going to this, that, I'd say, get out to the communities. Chicago's communities are unbelievably rich and vibrant and strong, whether it's in the South side, the far East side, south, southwest, it's just the, 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 the diversity and the, the, the strength and the courage of these communities. I just, I, that's my, it's not very profound other than I find great energy from these, the students. When I go out and see these students and what I learn from them and listening and their hope and dreams. When I go to talk to the parents and hearing about their hopes and dreams and God, how hard they're working, their commitment to, um, their children. I, you know, I, I've learned a lot from all of them about parenting, about being a good dad, about being a, a better husband. They may not agree, my children, my wife, but I've, I, I've learned a lot in hopefully getting better from these communities and how 
their focus on that and passing on values. And so I think what drives me every day to get out of bed, I can't wait to get to work. I can't wait to be out in um, this mission. And so that gets me every day because I want to be part of it. And I, I look at the people I work with, you and all the others in our team, who I am, I, I really do. I, I'm amazed at the what I learned from and, and inspired by and learn about um, the depth of your work with Scali. Like I, while I get to work with you in different ways in this mission, what you built and each one of the people on our team and what they're doing in addition to in building community here and around the, for you around the world, frankly. So I uh, to be in a mission with people who are unbelievably dedicated and committed is one of the greatest gifts. Thank you. Josh, I, I know you mentioned Father Foley, that he, yes. he, he definitely influenced your life. Um, Huge. One of the greatest influence. Uh, can you share a little, maybe one or two people that have influenced your life? You also mentioned your mother. Uh, yes. I, I have been personally, I would not be the person that I am without my mom. I yes, the good, the good in me is because of her. Uh, I, you know, if I one day can serve the way she serves, I made it. Because <laughs> she serves, uh, you know, with not looking for anything in return. You know, she she's a mother of service. Uh, you know, if I can love like my mom loves, you know that that will be probably my my great my greatest goal. So could you share a little bit about some of the people that have influenced your life and how? Yeah, there's um, along the way in different places, people that really influenced one, my mom, for sure, uh, her mission heart and um, her work and just, yeah, my mom was one of nine and her dad died when her youngest sibling was um, frankly in the womb. And so she, uh, you know, worked to help support the family and never, you know, went to college and helped raise, you know, the rest of that kids, my grandmother and, um, and how she raised all of us, um, but never was afraid to, to take on things and um, to lead. And uh, she like just this, this whole movement of, you know, um, Haiti became a whole thing in our parish, our school and our community frankly we had big drives for I, I just always amazed by just what you can do by picking it up and running with it and that if you're focused on the mission the mission the mission on yourself but on the mission then others are probably going to join in with you and say this is important work I want to be part of it that always just that you can just do it and you know our household is crazy with five kids and everything else but she just motored through it and um she would always say, so she got to muscle through, get tough, muscle through, tired, you know, just so I, that my mother had a big influence on me in that way. Just don't worry about all this stuff. Keep moving. You got to keep moving. And um, the mission's more important. Get it done and muscle through. And I always, I always loved that um, sense. So I would say that's the biggest influence. I would say um, the Jesuit Volunteer International Program, one Father Vindicola, who's the head of it. You know, he was always kind of a um, a voice in my head. One before I decided to do it, he was always after me. You should do this. You should do this. What are you doing for the kingdom? When I came back and was in consulting, he said, "What are you doing for the kingdom?" He was always on my case and you know calling me back to what I think he kind of knew what filled my soul and um, and that's how I got to Christ Ray and where I met Father Foley. I remember meeting Father Foley the first time and hearing about his life going to Peru and um, he just. Father Foley is the most faith-filled person. He's, he's unbelievable. And um, he never, and maybe he was, but he never showed any fear ever that we were, this is going to happen. Like, you just got to, you know, he always was looking up that it's so easy to say, oh, my God, it's not going to work. Look, we don't have enough money or we don't have enough this or you know, whatever it is. He always say God will provide, and people on the board who came from the business sector always like, oh, you know, kind of joking about the God will provide. And uh, you know, they're joking one time. I said, it, it's true though. He has it has worked, and so it's hard to argue with it. And that's sort of like fearless leadership of like, you know, all the chips are down. It's not going to work. You got to keep moving, and it may not be right where you decided, but you're going to be better off by pulling towards something versus 
retracting and saying, well, I give up, let's close the schools, let's close this, you know, that I think that's important, you know, when we think about the Catholic Church, like, where are we going? And what you're doing, Vicente, inspires me because, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people who said to you, you can't do this, Catholicism's on decline, faith's on decline in this country, that's not going to work, you can't build, you're not a religious, you're not, you know, I'm sure people told you a lot of things, right? But I watched Vicente say, I'm going to do it. And I watched over the last number of years and, and that inspires me, that sort of leadership. And so you inspire me in this work because it's not listening to the naysayers and the, the people. And I, I think I've taken that sort of from a number of people in my life more than anything. And, and frankly, Jim O'Connor at Big Shoulders Fund. I, I tell you, you know, we would not have the schools we have at Big Shoulders Fund today if not for his fearlessness. And my knees were knocking a lot more than his. And oftentimes that meant took taking uncomfortable positions with, you know, he's a um, strong Catholic, I, you know, with high up faith leaders, Catholic faith leaders. And I, that's not easy. And that sometimes meant standing up to his peers and saying, we're going to do this. We're going to find a way. And he did. He didn't just say it. He went out and did the work. He raised the money. He raised awareness. He spoke about it. He was everywhere. And he never, ever, ever, even sometimes I went to him, like, I don't know if we can do it. And Josh, we're going to do it. <laughs> and so I said, well, if he's in, I'm in. And I just, that fearless leadership of never allowing, and never allowing at least him to know the fear to creep in and be seen like, we're going to keep going. We're going to do this. And uh, I look at our team here, Big Shoals Fund, even when I've had knocking knees and I don't know, and you know the folks, Rebecca and John and Mikhail, you, others, you know, Amy will find a way. But every one of them lift up. So a lot of people in my life and um, who just showed the way that you got to keep moving. GWP, it'll happen. God will provide. Keep going. Yeah. They say what came to my mind uh, as you were speaking about people you admire is pessimists are always right. But optimists are the ones that change the world. Yeah, <laughs> much rather be in that category, you know. Right. Just a lot, lot, a uh, lot more fun, and certainly challenges and setbacks along the way. And you know, you, it's a lot of work because you you now say we're going to do this, and you got to go out and do it. Otherwise, it's over. But it's a uh, it's a much I just say a much better way to live, and I think a lot better for the world. And those are the people that inspire me. Fearless, just maniacally focused on you know what's best and. It's not about, you know, Escali's not about Vicente. It's about building the kingdom. Jim O'Connor, he doesn't benefit anything from this other than his soul is filled knowing that these strong schools and, and these great communities keep adding value. And um, so it's not about the individual. Father Foley was never about Father Foley. It was about, you know, this building this, this, this great program, this mission, this community, this, this pipeline to, the, to a brighter future. It was never about Father Foley. And I learned a lot from that. And it's easy. Sometimes I get in trouble and I start to think about Josh and not about the mission. And that never works. It's about the mission. Josh, uh, what would you say is, is uh, uh, this is a hard question, by the way. <laughs> what would you say is, the bullets. Is, is, uh, is the purpose of your life? That is a tough question. It's probably a simple answer, but it's a tough question. You know, growing up, you know, I joke about this, but in some ways growing up, you know, in a, I don't know if it's any different anywhere else, but an Irish Catholic family, you know, we didn't talk a lot about feelings and faith. It was just like we went to church and you, you do, you're supposed to do good. So go do good. It was just that, you know, there's expectation. This is the values that, that we've been given. We, um, and so there's a certain part of purpose for life is how do you leave the campsite better than when you got there? And so how do you contribute to making the world a better place and that someone else rests easier because you did something I think is a important part of a purpose for life. And I'm not saying that I've hit any of those marks and, um, but I think it's a calling to, to leave that campsite better. And I think that's a big part of, of some people find that, in lots of ways, spirituality, faith, lots of ways, right? Values that they were they were given. I'd say it's a little bit of all those for me, but that you're, you know, 
um, what did St. Francis say? Um, uh, go out and preach the gospel, use words if you have to. And um, again, I don't know if I'm doing any of those things, but I think that that at least is a calling of go out and do good in the world. And I hope, I guess that's a, I would say that I hope the purpose of my life is to go out and, and add value by building relationships and um, being a humble servant of being called to do. And if that, if I could achieve even a tenth of that or a, a decimal, that I feel like I, I have some purpose. Yes, a lot of a lot of people will never have the influence that you have on the kid. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I'm uh, a teen. I I know I know it is, but you have a, a huge influence. Josh, one of um uh, one of the one of your dreams that you want to achieve. Dreams you want to achieve. I um I think one of the dreams I want to achieve is um you know this sounds so and I don't but I don't I don't think it is, but I you know some people say, Oh my goodness, Josh. But a world where we truly um have uh love care empathy quality equity for all and all those things that divide us and pull us apart whether it's um you know protectionism for my group or greed or fear of someone that that is different different language different background they look different all those things that they break down and i i um I hope we're able to break down more of those barriers. That's my dream of the world. And I, and I, you know, my simple little belief, even a big shoulders fund, I think about our team at big shoulders fund and the diverse backgrounds and experiences. I think about the different communities we work in across the city and trying to find ways to connect certainly among those communities, but also our communities who may come from totally different places and, it may never have been in those communities that break down those communities. And oftentimes people are scared to go where they don't know, or it's different. And when they do go, they learn that these people are no different than I am. They all want the same thing. And I can learn a lot from that community and those, uh, these people. And we all are brothers and sisters moving toward a brighter future. And I, hope that we're a, we, and I, I really believe that we are breaking down those barriers. I watch people go across bridges that they've never been across, across divides that they never crossed and how those relationships build, just like anything, friendships develop and they bloom and all of a sudden divisions and barriers are gone. And I, I hope that in some small way in our little corner of the earth, that we're adding toward that that vision of, of really removing all that divides us. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to ask you some questions, but I'm not done. <laughs> hey, the toughest question. I'm sweating uh, bullets over here. I, this is hard hitting journalism. <laughs> you, you know, I, I really value the opportunity you gave me to ask questions. So, uh, I don't want to waste it. <laughs> this is my gosh. They're going to come back and say, Josh, you were wrong in this one. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, just to, to, uh, to give you some freedom, would you like to share a story that inspired you? Yes. Uh, or a moment in your life where you said, you know, that moment was a moment of, of profound meaning or profound turnaround. You know, just like a story, a moment in your life when you say, you know, that was important. That that touched my soul. Oh my gosh, I just feel like I have so many in different parts of my life, and um, I'm gonna go back further in in time. The um, you know, this is this is um, one of the things you know. Again, growing up in this country, and um, you know, frankly, being white and in and, and, uh, the communities I grew up in, and um, the experience of being um, uh, in the minority or not, or being different was, you know, to this day. And I think that, again, that gets into, you know, empathy and understanding 
the pathway of different people. I was over, I was in the Marshall Islands. I was in the Capitol Island. I lived in the Capitol Island. And you had, you know, um, obviously the Marshallese uh, community um, was dominant, but there was, there was a lot of foreigners from, from Australia, from the United States, Japan, China, for myriad reasons, which is a story for another day. But I spent uh, about two months on what they call the Outer Islands. And so I went out there to, um, one, to continue to work on language, uh, speaking Marshallese, Yako Yuk is Yet Amor, and um, which is, hello, how are you? Uh, and then I also, I lived with a family and then I uh, worked in a school there, uh, which was, you know, they didn't, it wasn't grades or anything. It was, it was a one room school building. And these outer islands had no, there was no uh, electricity. There was no cars. Um, they lived, lived still a very subsistence life. So we, I went out fishing with the men every day. And um, the, the women were in the cookhouse all day. I mean, God, the workload was unbelievably high. It was a like constant work to, to just to do that, just to, 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 you know, literally hunt, gather food, cook and eat. And, you know, again, it was, um, talk about a change in lifestyle to live in this outer island. Just all that we live with, all the complexity of life, of technology and lights and everything. It just is so much. And out there, when darkness came, you went to bed. That was kind of, you couldn't see anything. And uh, to wake up early in the morning, go walk on the, the reef and the fish. But then to walk the island alone, and I remember just walking down the island and every staring at me. It was a young child. I want to experience it. It was um, maybe three years old. And when this child saw it, I had never seen a white person and started screaming. I think it was, it was scared of, of, of me in many ways. And um, this community was, I was, they wrapped their arms around me. It was wonderful. I was, I, um, I felt so loved and so part of their community. And I would like to think on the flip side, it would be the same for them if they came into a community I grew up in. I don't know if that's the case. And um, it, that always struck me as, you know, um, understanding people's pathways and the privilege we've been given and the opportunities. And how do we, again, going back to breaking down barriers and building community means having empathy and understanding that broadens your view. And I've always carried that with me. When I went to Pilsen, a little village, I, I, I watched how I was so welcome and, and, and embraced. And I always thought, would that be the same in the community I grew up in? Or, you know, I just, I'd like to think I don't have a lot of confidence. Um, it's just, you know, so that always stuck with me. And if we're going to break down barriers and build, we need to understand perspective and experience and opportunities um, and how do we make sure those are shared and um, presented and given everywhere. And that means, you know, humility as well. And so that always, that was one of the most, um, and I think, you know, if I go back down the same thing when I was in Haiti, those experiences, again, how you, uh, Leave the comfort of of you know the security blanket of your community. Go into other communities. You grow a lot, learn a lot, and I I mean phenomenal experiences that I cherish forever. But it's also a perspective and understanding, which I think is important. Yeah, yeah, still one of the most important pillars of Catholic education. No, not at all. With no doubt. Uh, well, thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you and share. Muchísimas gracias, amigo. Muchas gracias por haber estado con nosotros. I hope that maybe one day we can do this with Father John Foley. He's the best. He's yeah. the best. Padre Juan Foley is the best. Yes, you should. My God, have you had him on the show? Yeah. No, not yet. But we will. Yeah, now, there's some inspiration. Yeah. Uh, Josh, final words. Final words are on you. Whatever What's you that? want to share with. Oh. Final words are on you. Whatever you want to share with the audience. Stay safe, healthy. Can't wait to see all of you on the uh, other side. And uh, the brighter, the future is brighter because of, of uh, great leaders like Vicente Del Real. <laughs> Josh, thank you so much for this conversation. God bless. Thank you very much. No olviden seguirnos en Instagram y en Facebook en Iscali Podcast. <laughs>
Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Iscali Podcast. Listen with us and experience the joy of the gospel. Escúchanos y experimenta la alegría del evangelio. Te esperamos. Dare to dream. Atrévete a soñar.